If you're in favor of freedom of speech, that means you're in favor of freedom of speech precisely for views you despise. Otherwise, you're not in favor of freedom of speech. Good evening, dear listener. You're back with Binghamton Review Live for another whole week. My name is Patrick, and I'm back with Matt and Jordan. Hey, guys. What's up, people? And we got a lot of good stuff to cover. Um, been a lot happening in national and international news. Um, so, um, who do we normally start with? We normally start with me, okay. so... Uh, we'll start with Matt this time. Yeah, exactly. We'll, okay, we'll work cool. our way out. Cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, my, my topic for this week is about uh, immigration policy, because um, there was a, a big decision uh, reached this week on a Trump policy, but in order to really talk about that, it's important to talk about two previous ones first. Um, so there was the, the decision uh, that was ruled by federal judge Dana Sabra. Um, that was the, the famous case about separating children from their parents, uh, like illegal immigrants or uh, asylum seekers who come to the country, they come to the border, um, and this judge ruled that you cannot separate the children from the parents, that they have to stay together. Um, another case, which was ruled by Judge Dolly G, um, she upheld something called the Flora Settlement, which said um, if a family comes to the border seeking asylum, we're trying to cross the border illegally, um, children have to be released within 20 days. They cannot stay in detention at the border. Um, so these two rules combined, as you can see, um, states that the family comes to the border, uh, within 20 days the children have to get released into the country with a relative or into a safe zone in the country if there are no relatives. But you can't separate the children from the parents, which means the parents have to go with them. So basically these two rulings together basically make it impossible for Trump to do anything. I mean, he was elected on fixing the immigration system, and he can't do anything because these federal judges are coming in and making decisions that they can't actually make. Like, there's no constitutional basis for any of these um, decisions. So what happens is these families get released into the country, um, then they skip their court hearings, which not all of them do, but um, hundreds of thousands every decade skip their court hearings, and then that's how we get part of our illegal immigration crisis. And now, this last week or two, um, Judge Richard Seaborg came in um, and ruled against Trump's solution of this. So Trump's solution was saying, okay, so we can't separate them and we can't keep the kids. So how about we make a deal that the families will stay outside of the border? They'll stay on the Mexican side, the Mexican government will take care of them until their hearing, then we'll bring them into the country. They'll do their hearing to actually see if they're criminals, um, why they're coming across the border, if there's legitimate asylum seeking purposes for them coming. Um, so basically, we, we wouldn't have to just release them into the general public every single time a family decides to come across the border. Um, this judge said, no, you can't do that either. So now Trump's like, well, what, what now? It, it, all of these judges are making decisions which are striking down his uh, striking down his regulations, which he has extreme authority over. I mean, he's the president of the United States. And he has authority over immigration. He has authority over immigration that there's no laws over. Congress has not made laws about this. This is just the president saying, this is the procedure we're going to take. And these judges are saying, no, actually, we're the legislatures here. We're going to make the policy for you. Um, and children have to be released into the country. The parents have to follow into the general public, which I find this insane. I find this a gross overstep of judicial authority. Like, to judges have something called judicial review, which means that they can interpret the law. They can say, no, no, the law says this, you can't do that. But now what these judges are doing is they're trying to do something called judicial supremacy, which is, no, we don't really like that law, or we don't like that policy, so we overrule the president, or we overrule Congress, which that's not a thing. Alexander Hamilton talked about that in Federalist 78, where um, he specifically said the judge, the, the, any judge, uh, Supreme Court, federal judge, they can't overrule, they have no will, they have no force, all they have is judgment, all they have is interpretation, and these judges are, uh, it's, it's one of my pet peeves in, uh, in American politics that so many judges think that they have the right to write laws, and now because of that, the president has absolutely no authority over uh, immigration as it stands, so there's a little more to the cases, which I can get into later, but I'm going to let Jordan say something if he has something. <clears throat> well, um, I don't really um, have a whole lot to say on this issue, because, I mean, you and I have discussed 
immigration extensively uh, on this show, but in this specific instance, I do tend to lean on your side on this, where I don't think that the Supreme Court justices should have more power than the president. You're supposed to be co-equal branches of government. You're not supposed to... There's supposed to be checks and balances in each of the three branches, and they're supposed to hold each other accountable. And so when, when one branch gets too powerful, that's a bad thing. No matter who's in charge, it's a bad thing. Uh, so I, uh, I, 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 so strictly from a, a sticking by the American system, uh, aspect of things, I, uh, I'm actually on your side, uh, Matt, but, um, another thing too is, with the separating kids at the border thing, I think we've mentioned this before, but that didn't start with Trump. That goes all the way back to Bill Clinton, so you can't really blame Trump for that. Yes, he's continuing it, but he didn't start it. It's not like he woke up one morning and was just like, oh, let me uh, separate kids at the border. Let me do that. That would be tremendous. He didn't do that. That was Clinton that did that. So if you're going to go... So my point being here that... If you're going to pick on a subsequent president for the crimes of another president, I'm not okay with that. You know, you know, you can't blame Donald Trump and then and then sort of put have a stranglehold on his right to power. Whether you like it or not, he's still the president and you have to again be co-equal branches of government. You can't just say, "Oh, we don't like this." Uh, what the president is doing, therefore, we're going to try to give ourselves more power in order to, to strangle you effectively. It's like no, you know, you can't do that. That's not how the system was designed to work. And I think honestly, the founders would be rolling over in their graves right now if they knew that this was going on. So, Matt. Oh, absolutely. Alexander Hamilton would in this country is crashing and burning if the judges are making all these decisions for the country. That's insane. Um, so the the policy I was talking about about leaving uh, the families outside of the border is called the, the, the Migrant Protection Protocol. That's what it's called. That was just struck down. Um, and now the Trump administration is trying something new because he's like the courts are not letting me do this, not letting me do this, not letting me do this, and I don't want to let them into the country, and just into the general public. That makes no sense. Um, so he's trying something called binary choice, which is um, family comes to the border, you go to the family, the you say parents. You're not being released to the public. That makes no sense. You have the choice. Kids stay with you, or kids get released into the country with a relative until the court hearing and everything, and we figure out what happens from there. But you're not being released to the public, and then they get to make the choice. And honestly, I'm fine with even a third choice of, like, the parents don't want to keep the kids in detention, the parents don't want to be separated, so we'll wait outside. You know, a mix of the three, where... Okay, I don't see what the problem with that is, but now... Trump's being attacked for that as well. It, I don't. I, I really. I don't understand. Um, so, all of that's happening. President Trump has no control over the immigration policy, and Congress isn't helping him either. So, the the whole thing's a mess. Congress refused to make a really cheap deal, uh, spending very little amount of money on a border wall, um, and they're also refusing to fund the border conditions. They're refusing to pay for more beds or, you know, better living conditions for the people who are being detained there, which is further making it so, so Trump has to release them into the public, where it's like, they can't stay there, those are bad conditions, obviously, because Congress isn't funding it. So, right now, President Trump, who was elected to fix the immigration system, has no control over it. And I think that that is extremely unconstitutional. I think that the court should have no saying this. And the, the way I think that they should go about this is the same thing that Barack Obama did. The uh, federal court in Texas ruled that the DREAM Act with Barack Obama was unconstitutional. And Barack Obama said, okay, still going to do it. You don't have power over me. <laughs> and that's what Trump should do. I mean, he could he could also try to challenge it, bring it up to the, the, the circuit courts, the courts of appeals, and they'll probably be like, no, you're also not allowed to do this because the... The Ninth Circuit is super liberal, and they'll probably say no. 
but then the Supreme Court, I think, would have, uh, allow it. So they, they, they could challenge it, but the reason that Trump's not doing that, the reason Trump's trying to work around and find new policy options is because of the way the media is covering it. If Trump goes and says, the court's not letting me uh, send the kids into the country, not the parents, then the media is like, oh my god, cruel Trump. We're starting to separate kids. I thought we already went over this. And it's like, well, so now he's trying to find a way to do it without losing the, the approval or the, the semi-approval that he got for saying I'm not going to separate kids anymore. Um, so he's trying to find a new policy such as binary choice, which lets the parents choose, which I think is extremely generous. You know, you're trying to get into our country, um, choose whether you want the kids to stay with you or go somewhere else, but you can't leave. I mean, why do you have the right to just walk into our country? Hmm. Yeah, that, uh, could you, uh, uh, explain that uh, last part to me one more time. I, I kind of uh, zoned out. So the, the binary thing. What yeah, were you saying? Binary choice is where like okay. if a family comes up to the border, you go and tell the parents like you are staying in detention until you get your hearing and you prove to us that you can come into the country. That either you have the right to political asylum, that mm -hmm. you actually are an asylum seeker, um, that you are not a criminal from another country, that mm -hmm. you're not trying to smuggle drugs or whatever. And once you get the court hearing, then you can go into the country if we approve it. Um, parents stay in attention, but you have the choice as the parents. Do you want the kids to be released into a safe area or with a relative in the country, or do you want them to stay in detention with you? Mm, so it's not okay. Trump that's separating the kids, it's the parents saying, no, I'd rather my kids not be here in this in this situation. Right, right. Is there any word yet as to uh, people's reaction to the binary choice thing? Like, has it been? Oh, yeah, he's being attacked for it. He's like, they're like, this is crazy. Trump's back to separating kids. <laughs> but all they want is for these people to be released in another country. That's in it's insane. Anything else, and it, everyone attacks him for it. Which, um, personally, I, I don't see a problem with this. And Trump tweeted 30 minutes ago about something new he wants to do. He wants to take illegal immigrants who are being led into the country this way and make them live in sanctuary cities only, nowhere else. So it's like, fine, you want to be a sanctuary city? You want to let these illegal immigrants stay here? Then fine, they'll feed off of your economy. It's not the rest of the country. Which, in an ideal sense, that's not a great policy, but with, with the situation where anybody who comes up to the border just gets to walk in, that's the correct answer, honestly. You guys are forcing my hand. You're forcing me to let them in. I'm not going to let them eat off of Texas's economy. They're going to go to your sanctuary cities. You're the one. You're the one pulling for this. Then you're the one who has to pay the cost. Which it's it's not going to happen. That's none of these policies I think are going to happen until Trump either ignores the courts or challenges it. But that th this is the thought process, and that's kind of why the Department of Homeland Security just resigned, semi got fired because like nothing that they do is working. So Trump's trying new things. It's it's just a mess. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, this is a uh, a complicated uh, situation to say the least. Um, my thing on this specific story, as I said earlier, is just you should never let the or or the the court should never allow themselves to exceed the power of the presidency. You're, you're supposed to be, again, co-equal branches of government. The, the judicial branch has no right to actively impede a president's agenda unless, of course, like, or, or at least try to overpower him to, to prevent his agenda from happening. There we go. I, I, I'm not saying that the Supreme Court can't disagree, because that's also not how our system works. They're allowed to... Uh, uh, interpret something that the president does as constitutional or otherwise, but you can't have that much more power than uh, than the president. So, um, purely from a constitutional uh, aspect, uh, I agree uh, with Matt. Now, uh, as our listeners, if you're listening from last semester or last year, or whatever, know. Uh, Matt and I have some significant disagreements on the issue of immigration itself, but on this particular issue, yeah, I'm on, I'm on his side on this one. Cool. All right, so we'll uh, we'll see whether this binary choice thing actually works out, you know, whether the courts decide to let up a little bit. Um, 
We'll probably move beyond the United States now. Uh, Jordan has something coming to us from our uh, greatest ally in the Middle East. That is not Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, this is uh, from Haaretz, which is uh, an Israel. It's an Israeli news site, and essentially the article details uh, the current Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's corruption charges that he has uh, leveled uh, against him, and uh, he just won re-election in Israel. I think just a couple days ago, um, and Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, okay. Um, so, the reason why I chose to cover this today is because, full disclosure, I don't like Netanyahu at all. Um, I, I, I really don't. Um, I think he is especially after reading this article, he's very uh, corrupt and very uh, just embroiled in, in these scandals, but also his foreign policy is something that I object to in terms of hyping up threats from Iran, you know, and um, the uh, Israel-Palestine issue and uh, how I, I'm not really with Netanyahu on that, I, I understand that um, Israel, when Hamas does something stupid, has the right to defend itself. I'm not saying it does not have the right to defend itself, but I think the problem here is the proportionality of the responses. And uh, so, basically, what I'm referring to here is Palest Palestine has these, like, primitive missiles and guns, and Israel, uh, in 2010, I think it was, uh, Obama gave them Iron Dome, and Iron Dome is a missile defense system, and uh, that can shoot down Palestine's rockets with ease, and they have way more, uh, a way more, the uh, IDF is way more advanced than Hamas will ever be, because they have a tremendous amount of backing from us because we give Israel, I think the average is $38 billion a year in taxpayer money. So, uh, this, and this is not, the reason why I was, I mean, I was hesitant to talk about this story, but it's a major story, so that's why I decided to cover it. But the, the major thing that I want to say here is I hate talking about Israel because Number one, if you say anything critical of Israel, certain people, not saying anybody in this room, but certain people are going to accuse you of being an anti-Semite. Um, certain people are going to accuse you of being an apologist for Hamas. It's like, well, no, if you know me personally, you know that I love all people. I don't accept Hamas. Hamas is the exception to that. I hate Hamas. They can go die in their desert somewhere. Um, but... Um, I just don't want to be straw manned. You know, I, I'm just saying that I have a problem with Netanyahu because of his, uh, his the way he handles si the situations with Iran and, uh, and and Palestine, and because he is charged with a lot of uh, corruption scandals, and even his uh, police, his own like police forces recommend that he be indicted, and they don't want to do anything about it because he's a very popular and very powerful leader on the world stage, so, uh, and obviously at home as well. So uh, this is a very complicated issue, but I really uh, don't want to be strawmanned as anti-Semitic. I don't dislike Netanyahu or Israel, the, the right-wing government in Israel, because they're Jewish. No, it's because of what they do around the world. That's what I oppose to. It's not their their religion. Their thank you. It's not their theological persuasion. It's their politics. This is a, this is a political issue, not a theological issue. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, yeah, Netanyahu has some corruption scandals. Obviously, no one here is for that. However, uh, I don't really care. It's not my country. Um, and if you're going to look at it from the perspective of, oh, that other country's corrupt, I mean, the countries around it are way more corrupt. So, I mean, like, we got to look at it for the standards. That's another one of my pet peeves when talking about politics is um, people will talk about something horrible that happened 
200 years ago. I'm like, yeah, well, by the standards of that time, of course it's horrible now, but back then it wasn't considered then. So let's let's like let's compare standards. And if you're gonna look at the standards of the United States and say the countries in the Middle East don't have those standards, like yeah, well, obviously. So that's not really shocking to me that other countries have corruption. I mean, we have corruption, and so this that doesn't surprise me. Um, foreign policy, Netanyahu, I like it. I do. <laughs> so, so there's there's two right wing ish parties in Israel. Um, there's the Likud party, which is what Netanyahu is mm -hmm. from. They won, and then there's like the the blue and white party, who is like a really really center party, but everyone's considering them a left party because they're more left than Netanyahu is. But really, they're just like a center right ish party. Um, as, either way, Israel would defend itself no matter which one won. Either way, Israel would have like a relatively aggressive stance towards uh, other countries or Palestine attacking them. Because obviously, I mean, the argument that they're weak missiles doesn't really appeal to me because if Cuba started launching really weak missiles at us, I don't care, we're taking them down. And I think Israel has the right to do the same. If you're trying to break down Israel's fences, if you're trying to break into the country, if you're trying to uh, kill IDF soldiers, if you're trying to launch missiles into the country of Israel, I think Israel has the right to take you down. So, it's all fine with me. Um, what was your third point? I don't even remember. Oh, the straw man thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. I was like, all right, that was, yeah. that was a lot. Because, um, like, if you criticize Israel, some people are going to accuse you of being anti-Semitic. It's like, no, this is not a, a theological issue. This is a polit I have political issues with Israel. I support their right to exist. I support their right to defend themselves. But I do have some problems with certain certain ways that they handle foreign policy matters, especially yeah. like the the right wing of Israel. So I have yeah. no issue with Israel at large. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't say that you're anti-Semitic for, for, for criticizing Israel's policies, but um, I'm guessing you're talking about the Ilhan Omar things where she was like criticizing Israel and then a bunch of people call her anti-Semitic, because she is. She honestly is. I mean, there's the, the, the way it works, because I think I know like kind of what you're talking about, is uh, a lot of right-wing commentators are calling like Ilhan Omar uh, anti-Semitic for her comments. Um, the, the rule that a lot of them have followed is um, if you're criticizing Israel's policy, then like that's fine. Like Everyone criticizes Israel's policy from time to time. Mm -hmm. If you're criticizing Israel for doing something that if a different country did it, you wouldn't have criticized them for, then then that's some kind of like discrimination towards Israel. That's That's... That's wrong. You're doing it just because it's Israel doing it. What did she... Yeah, but she's also she publicly out? condemned Saudi Arabia, so that's not a good argument. What? Yeah, she's also come out uh, and said and criticized the policies of Saudi Arabia, so that's not really... She's not really picking on Israel. She's And she's criticized the American government. Her comment, like, the all about the Benjamins thing, yeah, that was a little badly worded, but she was talking about the influence of money in politics. She wasn't saying, oh, because these people are Jewish, I don't like them. No, she was criticizing the ability of groups like APAC to lobby American politicians. Uh, so that, so I, I, I just don't see Ilhan Omar as, as anti-Semitic. She absolutely is. Was that, it, was, it, was that what she was called out for, the APAC lobby yes. thing? Okay. Yes, but the yeah. thing is, is she was anti-Semitic before that. She had anti-Semitic comments before that. If that was all she said, and then she apologized and it never happened again, then I'd be like, all right, dumb comments, probably not anti-Semitic. I mean, I wrote an article this week about not attributing malice where there isn't any, but she has it. I mean, she, she does not want Israel to exist. She's made that clear in the past. When those comments came out, there were three times within less than a month where she was called out for making an anti-Semitic comment. She apologized and did it again. I'm, I'm sorry, but she doesn't get a pass on this one at this point. She clearly does not think Israel has the right to exist. She is pro-Palestine in this instance. And she, she has animus towards Israel in places where it's not like, oh, I don't like the way they're spending their defense budget. It's like, no, it's, you just don't like Israel. So, I mean... Yes, there's a possibility of getting straw manned by some people, but I don't think that's the the overarching theme of the people who are pro Israel. I think that uh, a lot of them are pro Israel but will won't think that you're an anti Semite, just have the wrong opinion mm -hmm. from them if you uh, are anti this Israeli policy. Right. 
Um, so I guess like with you and me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't think you're anti. Right, right. Yeah. But th yeah. that has that's been a really big theme for the past two months. So I think it was. It is something that's important to talk about. Where um, people are criticizing Israel a lot, and people are getting a lot of slack for supporting or you know attacking Israeli policy. Um, so it is very relevant. Um, I don't. I don't think any of this really matters. That because the policies would have been the same if Netanyahu won or lost. They're just we're going to be slightly more aggressive. It's. I don't know. It's not our country. Right. <laughs> I, I. I think um, the the reason why I, I agree it's not our country, but I think the reason why I and a lot of people who kind of share my views on this issue care about it is because they get our tax dollars. You know, and they are. Uh, they are. Are, we have so in that way we have control and sway over what they do we have no control over what Iran does we have no control over what Bahrain does you know we you know so um, we can control uh, how we spend our money and who we give it to and when you are uh, when you give money to people like Saudi Arabia and Israel who have terrible records of killing innocent civilians, whether they meant to or not, innocent civilian deaths are innocent civilian deaths. It doesn't matter what the intent is, and I don't want my tax dollars funding that. Sorry, I just don't. So that's, I think, what people, the, the place where people like me are coming from. Yes, I agree, it's not our country, but our tax dollars prop up that country, and, and we contribute a lot to their economy, and uh, so that's why certain people... Well, yeah, I'm, I'm libertarian domestically, and I'm libertarian on the world stage, too. I'm not really a fan of giving money to other countries that think our tax dollars should go to us. However, if there's a country to give our tax money to, it's Israel. They're it's such a huge ally. If we lose them, that's a huge loss to us. Um, they are a democracy. They're a, a huge, they're the, the one democracy in the Middle East. They are one of the, they, they're the least corrupt country in the Middle East. They're the most morally correct country in the Middle East. I mean, if Palestine was con had control of that land, there'd be no Jews. There wouldn't, but Christians, Muslims, they, they all live within the country of Israel, and they all have rights there. I mean, it, it, Israel is a good country. Yes, it has flaws, but we're, we can't compare it to our standards as living in the United States compared to other countries. And in, 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 the, in the, the international world, we have to sometimes take sides. I'm not a complete isolationist. We have to have some countries who are allies, and that's going to involve taking countries who have different standards, who are more wrong than us. It just happens. I mean, the, the world stage is a chess game, and we can't just say, nope, every country that has a different belief than us on X thing, every country who's done something wrong, we can't be allies with. Um, so, I, I, I don't mind. If we're going to give money to somebody, it should be Israel. All right, yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll see what uh, Netanyahu decides to do in his new term. Yeah. Um, fifth term. Yeah, fifth term. Isn't he the longest term prime minister? I think yeah. so, yeah. Yes, he is. All right, yeah, so we'll, uh, he has plenty to look forward to, um, we imagine. And uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, what he does next. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's it for us today. Um, thank you for listening to Binghamton Review Live. You're listening to WHRW 90.5 FM Binghamton, and we've got more PA programming on the way.